Hey, good evening, 7 US. Uh, welcome into this week's fireside chat. Our topic today continues on that same theme we learned earlier this week, which is what happens in England does not stay in England, or the opposite of Vegas. So the theme for tonight's discussion is on a pivotal political, pivotal political, nice alliteration, pivotal political transformation that occurred in Europe specifically starting in England, and then made its way across the Atlantic. And that is the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a topic that you will not only learn this year with me in seventh grade, but you'll also learn about the Enlightenment in ninth grade government, as well as seventh, uh, 11th grade A push. So, and even your world and your, I should say, don't, no disrespect to world and uh, Euro, but you're going to learn about the Enlightenment for the next five years of your uh, your your history time here at Basis Chandler. So this is a pretty important seminal topic. Now the Enlightenment, broadly speaking, <clears throat> think of what the word in general means. Clarity, uh, knowledge, growth of the intellect. The Enlightenment encompasses all those ideas, but we're going to channel it into conversation specifically with regards to political thought. At the end of the 1600s, as we talked about in class, England went through a tremendous change. The Glorious Revolution brought about a new government. William and Mary took over uh, the monarchy in England. And that triggered tremendous effects across all of Europe. You know, people really took notice of how England had gone from uh, one king to a new king without any war, without any turmoil. And that really kind of got people talking about different ways to rule and what are the responsibilities of government. The Enlightenment is really all about people talking, more specifically people writing. People writing about governments, people writing about monarchies and the, the responsibilities of the monarchies. That's what the Enlightenment really comes down to. If people were writing and talking about the best governments that are out there and the best theories on government. Now, these are ideas that maybe have been around for a long time, but people weren't writing about them. Why not, you may ask? Well, fear. It was dangerous to write about governments. Um, it, it, could get you, it could get you killed. You could wind up in jail. Uh, if you're lucky, wind up in jail. So people were reluctant to talk about governments, especially write about governments. Also, government you know, it didn't seem like the type of topic that was, that was really even on the table for conversation. You know, monarchies ruled with absolute authority, divine right. There was no choice. There was no options that were out there. But the Glorious Revolution kind of began to cr creep, the, 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 the sort of idea began to creep in that, that governments may be up for debate and that people could have a say, perhaps, in how governments worked. Now, we know England was unique, not just because of the Glorious Revolution, but also because England had a parliament. They had already a sort of check and balance on the, um, the, the monarchy in which the monarchies had to sort of work with parliament on matters of war and taxing and voting for parliament. So England was not a full on monarchy and that's, that's definitely relevant here uh, because England is going to be the birthplace of the enlightenment. It's really where the enlightenment starts off. And what I'm gonna do sort of here is uh, give you some some key people. Uh, any U.S. history class, any world class, any Euro class. <clears throat> there's 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 a couple titans of the Enlightenment. And what I mean by titans of the Enlightenment, there are some big players. There are some thinkers that stand out above the rest, and these thinkers are going to be heavily, and I mean heavily, uh, influential. And in not just what they write about in the Enlightenment, but more long-term effects. The Enlightenment is some serious. PSF, baby, some serious PSF. So we want to be fully aware of the PSF when it comes to the Enlightenment. Well, let's just get down to business here. I'm going to start with the guy that really kicks it all off, and that's John Locke. John Locke is arguably one of the most important names of the Enlightenment. Locke wrote his most famous work, Two Treatises on Government, uh, in the late 1600s, right around the time of the Glorious Revolution. Be careful because Locke didn't write the document. It wasn't published till after the Glorious Revolution. Sometimes people think that 
uh, Locke strongly influenced the Glorious Revolution. He did not. He wrote after the Glorious Revolution took place in England. Now, Locke's ideas, I mean, this, this is so dense, and I'm just going to really bo boil it down to a couple key bullet points. Locke's, one of Locke's main ideas was protection of property. He did not think that the government should interfere with people's private property, that that should remain people's private property. Uh, possessions like like a home you know the, your home is your home the government shouldn't mess with your home unless you're doing something wrong and that kind of gives birth to maybe one of the, the most important Lockean ideas that you guys can ever remember uh, he believed in protection of private property and as a result of that that idea that protecting people's private property Locke believed in a simple concept that would have transformative effects and would be plagiarized later in history uh, to an extent by Thomas Jefferson. Life, liberty, and property. Those three concepts were John Locke's core values that he espoused, that he spoke about, that he wrote about. He believed that the government was supposed to protect those three um, ideals for all their citizens, doesn't matter who it is. Life, liberty, and property should be protected by all three uh, all three should be protected by the government, I should add. Now, Jefferson, who would write the Declaration of Independence, borrowed heavily from Locke. Jefferson just changed the wording to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's why I say he kind of plagiarized John Locke. So there's your PSF for John Locke. Um, the last thing about Locke is he really believed in this idea of a social contract. And that kind of ties back to LLP, life, liberty, and property. Locke believed that, that the government and, and its citizens were supposed to sort of enter into an agreement on how to behave. Uh, in other words, that it was the government's responsibility to protect life, liberty, and property, but it was the people's responsibility to follow the government. So therefore, there was a contract between them. And both parties had to agree to do what was best for each other. So Locke's social contract theory uh, that would also be improved on by a lot of other Enlightenment thinkers uh, as well. And so Locke is really like one of the most influential political thinkers of the entire Enlightenment. In fact, his ideas are going to be really borrowed heavily by uh, American political thinkers like Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, um, F James Madison, you know, a framer of the Constitution. So Locke is a big dog. And that's why I start with Locke. He's one of the big ones. Now, someone who borrowed Locke's idea of the social contract theory and then expanded it even more was a French Enlightenment thinker. Uh, and the Enlightenment went to France uh, from England. It, it, it diffused there. And the guy you're looking for here, I call him JJR for his initials, John Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau's seminal work, his most important political contribution to the Enlightenment, was uh, the social contract theory. That was actually the name, the social contract. That was the name of uh, Rousseau's book, The Social Contract. Now, Rousseau borrowed that same idea from John Locke, but he expanded upon it. And Rousseau wrote greatly about um, individual rights within government. Rousseau was different than Locke, though, because remember, France was a hardcore monarchy. Uh, France didn't have a parliament. So when, when Rousseau was writing about the French government, he was dealing with a much different circumstance than John Locke. In England, Locke's ideas were embraced much more. So, whereas in France, you know, the government was very much opposed to anything like the social contract theory because that meant that the government would have to give to the people. And the French government was very uh, separate from the people. They, they didn't really have any connection to the people. It was just the king's word and that was it. But Rousseau is an important uh, writer because, number one, again, he, he, he dignifies the idea that France was, in part, was a big part of the Enlightenment. That's... That's 100% accurate. Also, Rousseau's opening line to his book, The Social Contract, is one of the great lines and most quoted lines, maybe, in all of literature history. Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. That was uh, Rousseau's quote. And I, I know as a French major, we used to talk about that quote in some of our classes. And it's kind of open to interpretation, but it's one of the great quotes uh, for, in world history, really. Uh, about the status of people and their governments, which again was what the Enlightenment was all about. Now I'm going to take a quick breather and I'm going to turn it over to my man, Christian Lee, our, our resident te uh, teacher's assistant. Christian's going to talk to you about two more people, uh, both were French. Um, 
Montesquieu and uh, Voltaire. So two more enlightened thinkers for you to, re to be aware of. So Christian, take it away on our two French enlightened thinkers. Thank you, Mr. Smith. What's going on, 7th grade U.S.? Hope you guys are all having an outstanding day. Today we'll be talking about Montesquieu, as well as another man named Voltaire, and how their ideas influenced the way our Constitution was written and uh, the society we live in today. Now, I'd like to begin with Montesquieu. Montesquieu was born in 1689, died in 1755, um, probably about during the French and Indian War, uh, before, before you know, our war for independence and the eventual writing of the Constitution. However, his ideas did not die. The Constitution was drafted based upon his ideas, and the person who found the most influence from Montesquieu was James Madison, as we know, is one of the major writers of the Constitution. So, the Founding Fathers like, um, drew upon Montesquieu's theory of the separation of powers. That our government is split into three branches, the Executive, which is the President, the Legislative, Congress, and the Judicial, the Supreme Court. Now, that idea was not our brainchild. In fact, it was actually Montesquieu's. Now, Montesquieu believed that the government should be split into three different branches, or there should be some sort of um, system of checks and balances, which is what we use today, meaning that no branch of government has too much power over the other, and so each of them can make sure that each one is in check, which is where, I guess, checks and balances comes from. Now, turning the page over to a man about Voltaire. Voltaire, we can thank for our First Amendment rights. Voltaire was heavily laid heavily upon um, the freedom of speech. Voltaire felt that it was necessary that everybody should be able to express their ideas and their beliefs without it being suppressed by the church in one way or another. And I will leave you guys off with this quote from Voltaire. He says, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. I may not agree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to make an ass of yourself. All right, you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, Chris Jan, and we appreciate you coming in to join us. Um, former A-Push Nation hero and legend Christian Lee, folks, with a good breakdown of Montesquieu and Voltaire. So what can we take away from this? We have four enlightened thinkers to really be aware of. John Locke, um, Rousseau, Voltaire, and Montesquieu. The common theme is these individuals will all play definitive roles in promoting ideas that are going to be embedded in eventually the American government. It goes without saying, the Enlightenment's ultimate past shapes the future is how strongly it influenced the future American government. Um, I, I can't say that enough. Um, and, and granted, in its own right, the Enlightenment was a wonderful, wonderful example of transatlantic exchange, ideas from Europe coming over to the Americas, coming to the colonies. And, and later this week, we're going to tie this all together with another transatlantic exchange movement uh, that will be about religion. And, and that's going to have an equally pivotal, um, an equally pivotal uh, impact on life in the colonies and the way people thought and the way people acted. You know, we're really setting up and we're getting very close to the point we can talk about the revolution and behind so many of the revolutionary ideas about the way that governments should treat people were ideas from Locke and Rousseau and Montesquieu and Voltaire. So that is the ultimate PSF here tonight, folks. And it reinforces that theme we've been establishing all week, which is how what stays in England, or I'm sorry, what happens in England doesn't stay in England. So I'll leave you with that fireside chat this evening. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure, remember, Write down questions. We'll clarify some of these points tomorrow in class before we hit our new topic, all right? So write your questions down. Come in tomorrow. We'll do some chat about the Enlightenment. In the meantime, have a great rest of your evening, 7 U.S. And as always, the past shapes the future. Have a good night.